Ladies and gents, my name is Simon Brown, uh, not doing this evening's Power Hour. Uh, we've got Grant Locke. He is uh, he's sort of the main guy that counts at Outfest. Actually, I take that back. There's many guys and girls that count at Outfest. Um, he's one of those that count, and he's the one who's going to be doing our presentation this evening. If you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. We will take them at the end of the presentation, but we have got some time at the end of the presentation for the questions, so certainly that is possible. But with that, uh, Grant, I'll hand over to you. All right, uh, Simon, thanks very much for having us on the, on the show and on the JSC Power Hour. It's a, really a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I think, you know, one of the things we don't get to do very often is to sort of look really under the hood of what Artfest actually is and why it was created and how it works. And it's, it's, almost, it's, it's actually a real pleasure to have an audience tonight that is sort of involved in that detail. So, you know, <clears throat> if you think about it, a lot of the work around Artfest goes on behind the scenes. I mean, what you see when you navigate through the digital journey is a very small proportion of what, Art, what Artfest is and how it works. And tonight's my opportunity to give you a really deep dive into the system. So again, you know, we'd love your questions. I'd love to hear, ask me questions about anything from the way the algorithms are built all the way to the way that we design the investment products, the way that we use S&P Dow Jones and core shares and how we select between those. And again, <clears throat> so please feel free to dive in. I think I'd like to just give a bit of, maybe a bit of a back step. You know, what is Outfest actually? So, you know, when we describe ourselves, we talk about robo-advisors or we talk about being able to build your own investment plan. And, and sort of that is, that is around helping, an, helping a consumer understand what it is. What it actually is, is an outcomes-based investment platform. So when I was working overseas, I worked in London for, for many years for a company called Schroders. And I was working for a team in the, called the multi-asset team. And the purpose behind the multi-asset team was to design investment portfolios and investment products that would encompass multiple assets. And one of the reasons you do that is diversification. So of course, and the reason that that works is because if you think about how volatility is calculated in the portfolio, one of the inputs into that is the correlation between the movements in the value of an asset class. So for example, if you combine bonds and equities in a portfolio, because bonds and equities typically, and of course, recently we've seen something different, have got a, a lower correlation. Typically, when equities are running, bonds are falling in the business cycle sense. You sort of, as, they ca as their price movements cancel each other out, the overall volatility of a portfolio is, is, is sort of decreased. In addition to that, as you add more stocks or more stocks into a portfolio, you diversify away the stock-specific risk in your portfolios. I mean, those are the basic theories behind multi-asset portfolio construction, but it goes a whole lot deeper than that. But when, you, when you're working in an asset manager and when you're designing these new investment strategies, so you're designing a diversified growth fund or you are working on a thematic portfolio that sort of does risk parity or volatility targeting for whatever you're trying to do, one of the biggest problems is you don't know who your consumer is. When you look inside a unit trust or an ETF, you don't actually know who those people are and what they're trying to achieve. And that for me was the biggest problem with, um, with being an asset manager. I didn't know anything about my clients. And what I thought about it is that actually, when you're trying to solve a client problem, the investment return is only half the problem. It's only half the solution. The other half of the solution is, what are that person's objectives? If you knew those objectives, it would be a lot easier for you to then design an investment approach or create a set of expectations for you to reach that. And that's really the principle behind Artfest. Invest, the investment products are not the whole of the solution. So, right, let's dive right in. Uh, let me just make sure I can move this. So the agenda tonight is under the hood of automated advice and how it helps clients get to outcomes. And this is the real thing that I'm quite passionate about. It's about being able to create a set of algorithms that encompass good practice. And the key thing about it is we all know common sense advice investing. I mean, if Simon and Christia, I mean, that's what they do every single day. They are brilliant at uncovering what the truth is behind how you should invest in an ETF, what ETF you should be picking, thinking about insurance. I mean, the number of people that Simon and Christy have helped over the years is probably, I mean, it's, I'd, I'd be amazed they've actually added value to society. But what happens if you wanted to give good quality advice 
to millions of people at almost no cost. Well, Simon and Christie is one way of doing that as well. But what automated advice algorithms do is that they allow good quality financial planning practices for almost no cost to anyone who uses them. In addition to that, um, when you're designing the investment exposures, it's not about beating a benchmark or it's not about trying to um, you know, have the most far out investment exposure into Chinese A shares. It literally is about trying to help that client reach their outcomes, taking only the minimum amount of risk possible. And the truth is what Outfest does is it combines both of these things together and it, its purpose is to deliver outcomes. And tonight I'm gonna to share with you a stat about what percentage of clients' outcomes actually reach using the platforms. And it's not about clever structuring using investment banks. It's not about color strategies. It's not about insurance protection. It's nothing like that. It is simple, good quality advice. Okay, so the reason I show you this slide is, is I wanted to show you not just that we regulated, is that we are regulated for automated advice. That's a new category at the FSCA that in order to provide automated advice, you actually have to be regulated. And in order to sort of be regulated, there's a certain sector that you've got to comply with, which is things to do with how much technology, the resources you've got, how you back up your automated advice, how you monitor your automated advice and all that other aspects. We're also an administrator as well. So not only do we provide the automated advice, we also process all the instructions for clients, we process debit orders, we generate tax certificates, we make sure that your instructions are going to into the right fund, withdrawal instructions, calculation of capital, all that kind of stuff is done on our platform as well. And I'll tell you why. Well, now that you've got the automated advice piece, you also now have the administration piece. That's one part of getting to outcomes. It's about providing the upfront advice, but also being with clients on the journey. What happens if they miss the debit order? What happens if they contribute more than expected? What happens to their outcomes? So it's really not just about an upfront advice process. It's also about making sure that you take people on the journey with you. And to that, you need data. And this is one of the reasons why we've taken categories of functions, regulated functions that don't normally sit together and vertically integrated them. We also administer our own pension schemes and we have the pension schemes ourselves. And this is one of the reasons why We've also been able to, um, to offer one fee. Okay, so automated advice systems, it's all about outcomes. So how do you design outcomes? Now remember in the industry at the moment, it, you've got a, this value chain that we use is largely sort of almost independent across much of it. The financial advisor is not necessarily related to the investment platform that looks after your money or administers your investment. And the platform's not necessarily related to the investment manager. And this was all about giving clients freedom, giving financial advisors freedom to be able to plan for their clients' wealth. But the problem is, is if you do this, the asset manager doesn't know anything about the client. The platform knows everything about what the client's doing in terms of the instructions they're processing, but they, know, they don't know why the client is doing it. Only, only the financial advisor knows that. So what we did is we said, look, we're building an automated advice platform and the purpose behind it is to translate client objectives into a language a machine can understand and make it easy for a client to set up those objectives and make and manage their expectations. The investment administration around combines um, the client's plan with the actual what the client has done, whether they've invested in line that plan, whether they've missed their debit orders, whether they've changed funds, whether they're sitting in a tax-free savings account or whether they're sitting in a retirement annuity, what are the rules around retirement annuities and withdrawing before the age of 55, et cetera, et cetera. And then the investment management is actually the market return. Let's put this into another way. Think of it like a car. The, the sort of the returns from the capital markets are the engine. That provides you the return. The asset allocation is the gearbox, the combination of different sources of market return that provide, that you can put together to provide a client with a return that they need to be able to achieve their objective. And then everything else around it is around helping shape the client's behavior to help them achieve their objectives. So the philosophy of automated advice, we are outcomes focused. It's 
you know, I think it's talked about a lot in the industry at the moment, but there's just not a lot of people actually doing it, you know, combining it, turning it into a language, actually helping clients get to outcomes. So the other thing about it is that, you know, you, you get a lot of these systems that ask clients these very detailed questions about their financial circumstances. And many clients can't answer those, you know, because they don't, either they don't know the answer to them, they don't really understand the question. So the idea was to keep the advice simple and easy to understand. So when you use Artfest, it's simple to use, but that doesn't mean it's simple underneath it. In the core advice system, the voluntary advice system, which deals with voluntary and tax-free savings accounts, there are 640 core calibrations in that algorithm. Yes, it's simple in terms of being able to use, but the advice that's provided, the customization, the tailoring of that portfolio is not simple. Because in addition to that, you've got the outcomes from the cash flow engine as well, which creates a set of expectations for the client that gets stamped. And we measure ourselves against those original expectations. The other point is that disclosures are vital. And it can't just be these generic disclosures that are sort of sitting on a form somewhere. You've got to be able to help a client understand why if they're going in for a long-term investment objective, yet you provide the out-cautious fund as, as a solution, you've got to help them understand why. Whether it's because their credit card debt has meant they are at a situation where they're financially stressed and they might withdraw early. And then lastly, you need to also make sure that the client has the right to override the systems. You can't have a funnel where that is completely fixed in nature. The client has got more information about their circumstances than you do, and you have to allow that system to override it. And the last thing, it's really not all about upfront advice. Really what we find most difficult is actually transitioning a client through their investment journey. So I know that for a lot of you guys, and especially the audience here tonight, a lot of you are self-directed investors. A lot of you are individuals who sort of do it themselves, buy, buy ETFs, etc. And that's a passion of yours. That's not necessarily a passion for everybody. But that doesn't mean that everybody shouldn't be able to get super high quality, low cost, good quality financial planning. And that's what Artfest is trying to do. So obviously, this is just to show you that we are regulated as an automated advice provider. And, and you know, again, what that actually means is it's even more highly regulated than just non-automated advice. There's a couple of other things you add on. There's no, it's not watered down regulation. It's actually even higher. So it, obviously, and what that means in terms of capital is more cost. So how we develop government and automa govern automated advice algorithms is... Funnily enough, this is actually um, one of the most difficult things to do at Artfest. Because when we develop a prototype, for example, we recently are developing a prototype that helps someone decide the right fund as they approach retirement, depending on whether they're going to use a living or a guaranteed annuity or a combination of both. Because when you choose a living annuity, as you approach retirement, it means that effectively you are planning to remain invested in risk assets and a life staging approach might actually cut off some of your, your growth as you head into your retirement years. I mean, the living room, if you're going hundred percent into a living annuity and you're going to have a high equity component, it doesn't make sense necessarily to life stage, but a lot of clients don't know what they're going to do at retirement. So you've got to give them the option to say, well, if you choose a guaranteed annuity, then definitely we need to last stage you down. But if you're choosing a living annuity, you might need to stay invested in risky assets. But of course, in order to develop this algorithm now, we've got to have an inputs from tax, actuarial, financial planning, and legal. And the algorithm, it could be in an Excel spreadsheet, it could be in a SQL system, but that's the prototype of the system. Once that prototype is developed, we've then got to document it. And every algorithm in our platform has got a white paper. That white paper is in a document that explains how the algorithm was developed, what the thoughts are behind it, and importantly, what the flaws are on the algorithm. Because there's only so many inputs we can do, and we must be able to limit the use of the algorithm to only where it is applicable, only where it makes sense. In Artfest, no algorithm, the voluntary advice system, the system that recommends voluntary funds within voluntary products and tax-free savings accounts is not the same 
as the retirement annuity advice system is not the same as the fixed outcome endowment advice system. They're all different systems. Each of them is a customization or a completely new system. It might have the same philosophy, but it's not the same system. Those algorithms, once they reach prototype stage and we're comfortable with them, they're approved by an advice committee. And that advice committee is a number of senior people at Artvest plus independent consultants. They have to peer review and they have to sign it off. And that's an, that's an approved algorithm. Once that algorithm is approved, it then goes into IT implementation. And then that is built depending on the user experience and that is implemented in code. And then of course it's monitored from there on in. So that's how we do it at Artfest. The core principles of every advice system are time horizon and willingness and ability to tolerate investment risk. So asset allocation is dependent on time horizon as one of the key factors, but it's not the only factor. The second factor that's not related to time horizon is the financial ability of the individual to tolerate investment risk. So what happens, it, it effectively depends on whether the product has liquidity or not. So in your tax-free savings accounts and your voluntary, they've got liquidity. They've got four days and then the money's back in your account. But because they've got that kind of liquidity, if you're under financial strain or there's a possibility you're gonna want your money early, we've gotta make sure that the fund that we select for your time horizon does not put you at risk if a market were to crash. And that's where the 640 calibrations come in, is taking that into account. The last factor, which is not related to ability or time horizon, is someone's willingness to tolerate investment risk. This is by far and away the most difficult thing to assess because you know, when we were building the systems, we didn't think, in our opinion, you could ask someone, hey, listen, how would you feel if your investment fell by 10% over a month? What would you do? If someone's never invested before, they're not going to know what to do. They're going to get a fright. So, but by the same token, if you said to someone, listen here, cool, um, how would you feel? And they said, no, I don't, want, I don't want that to happen at all. And if they've got a 20-year investment role, you're actually putting them at risk of not performing in line with inflation of damaging their growth prospects of their money. It's a very, very difficult balance. And that's one of the reasons why we use a hybrid approach. We have got human advisors that our clients can talk to around making sure that the balance is set properly between someone's time horizon, willingness and ability to tolerate investment risk. But that's the overarching algorithm principles that we apply to every single algorithm we develop. And that's set out, and there's a lot of legislation. The CFA Society, for example, has a similar overarching philosophy when in its coursework, you've got the same thing that was started by the FCA in the UK, they also have that. So the regulatory regime around how you develop advice systems is starting to finalize, it's starting to crystallize around this type of approach of providing advice. And then again, each algorithm, so for example, in the voluntary, in the tax-free savings account algorithm, we only recommend one fund. We don't blend funds. And once you see, once we get to the investment exposures, we'll, we'll help you understand why. When I was, when we were setting up Artvest, we went to go and see other robo-advisors like Nutmeg, for example, in the UK. And they've got what you call an individual account approach. So which means that it's like, it's like you would at any stockbroker. You'd have an individual set of account, an individual account for each investor, and they'd all have a combination of shares and ETFs, okay? But the problem is, is when you want to rebalance that account for them, and you're doing it on mass, you're doing it for 35,000 accounts, for example, to minimize the trading costs in that portfolio can be meaningful, especially when you've got a model portfolio or something that you're rebalancing to, which has got 30, 30 investments in it. 12 ETFs, 15 stocks, et cetera, et cetera. To balance, let's say, 10,000 Rand against that portfolio is very difficult to do. And the trading costs might just wipe out a lot of the returns the clients can expect. So it's one of the reasons why we kept administration very, very simple. And it also means that the asset allocation, which is the dominant driver of returns in all of our portfolios, is the same for every single client in every single fund. Now, how did, we, how did we go about estimating the return from every fund? 
you know, this is one of the key inputs is when you go to go through Artfest, you get an, an uh, sort of a, an outcome or an expectation of what you could expect. And what we did here was we, we sort of, I used to work with a data set overseas called the, the sort of the Dimson, Staunton and Marsh data. And it's sort of a study done by three professors at London Business School, Elroy Dimson, Paul Marsh, and I think it's Paul Stanton. And um, they basically have built a data series that goes back 115 years for about 27 different regions and for equity, bonds, cash, and inflation, um, and bills as well, you know, cash and bills. And so that data set's probably the most reliable and complete data set that we've got on long-term stock market returns. And what we did with each of those is we took those those sort of returns for the asset classes and the geographic region, we matched it as closely as possible to each of the portfolios, and then we simulated a series of returns using a, a Monte Carlo, so a stochastic modeling engine. And what that did was for, for sort of that distribution of possible returns for every time horizon for every asset class, and this is the table you see in front of you. And what this gave us an indication is that if you use 115 years of data, cash, or money market probably returns in line with CPI or above 59% of the time. Now this is obviously X fees. So about 59% of the time over the last hundred years with the time horizon of less than one year, a money market index is delivered in line with inflation. When you add some equities in, and of course in some government bonds as well, over the last 115 years, the out cautious, which is basically about a 45% uh, weighting to bonds, uh, and then a sort of extra cash on top of that. So over 50% in bonds and cash, outperform CPR plus two, around 60 to 62% of the time. The idea behind these estimates, and you can see for the out stable and the out moderate and the out, out aggressive, and that's how we calibrate time horizon. So when you select the time horizon on the out vest, uh, advice algorithm, the first thing you're going to do is it's going to sort of look at what your time horizon and then match it to a portfolio um, that is suitable for that time horizon. And then it will calculate the expected returns for you based on that, that portfolio. The purpose behind this is not to promise returns. That's not the purpose. The purpose behind this type of calibration is to set an expectation that clients can bank on, that we can feel comfortable with. So, you know, you can see that it's outperforming CPI plus two 60% of the time, not 40% of the time, not 50% of the time, 60% of the time. That 60% is a margin of safety. So we could have given clients more aggressive return expectations, but that would have compromised the margin of safety. And we're trying to get clients to their outcomes. So that's why it says at 60 and not at 50. So you can obviously override the algorithmic advice system, but we'll record that on the platform. It's not, it's not to hold anyone, it's not to sort of hold anyone to account, but it is to take, it is to give investors the freedom to disagree with the advice that we provide. But of course, as we're automated advice providers, we have to record that because we're responsible for the advice. Okay, that's the automated algorithm side of the equation. That's the, that's the sort of 10 minutes on how we do algorithmic investment and um, on automated advice systems. So you can imagine that algorithmic advice goes hand in hand with the investment portfolios that we design. And I've, I've sort of covered them in a little bit of detail to date, but now let's go into the detail of why we did investing this way. So I know, um, obviously I'm a, a sort of, I'm a CFA charter holder. I've worked in the asset, I've built portfolios. I used to do manager selection. I used to do fund of fund portfolios. I worked in the multi-asset teams of a global asset manager. And um, I know that at the moment, uh, the, the sort of the, the desire for everyone is to own ETFs. And it's seen as the cleanest, cheapest way to do it. And certainly for some investors, it absolutely is because the TERs are so low. And as long as you control your transaction costs and you make sure that you, you know, your, your market, your sort of your market maker, the spread from the market maker is not huge and you don't transact very often, you, you could do okay. You know, that, that's quite a cheap way of doing it. 
but when you're industrializing this system and when you're trying to provide low prices to everybody, we needed to be a little bit more circumspect about how we built the investment approach for lots of reasons. So what you're seeing here is an overview of the five portfolios available in the Artfest platform. The money market fund is the Granite Money Market Fund, and that's managed by Granite Asset Management. That is an active manager. But if you look at this Beaver report, which is the report that's compiled by S&P Dow Jones Indices, in the cash returns, active management does work. Active management does help outperform Steffi, and that's because the duration and the credit selection has a big impact on the return, and the, the, the sort of the margin around Steffi is quite small, and there is a possibility for an active manager to deliver. So that's why we do it that way. That's why Granite is active. In all of the risk portfolios, they are passive. And it's those portfolios that are the ones that took the most work. So when we designed this, you remember that because we've got an automated advice algorithm, because we've got a cash flow modeling system, we can't have a situation where the outcautious index fund is managed by another manager and the outstable fund by a different manager. Because if they decide to change the asset allocations, they're changing the major drivers of the return for each of the portfolios, which means that, for example, the outcautious fund could have a higher volatility than the outstable index fund. And in an automated advice system, that could cause you a class action because your, your advice is inconsistent. You assess a client for a low-risk portfolio, suddenly the outcautious fund has got a much higher volatility than the outstable fund and it puts you and your client at risk. We needed to control that as tightly as possible. And so what we ended up doing was we worked with core shares and with S&P Dow Jones indices to design a set of custom multi-asset indices. And what that means is that each of the asset classes in this portfolio, the outcautious or the outstable, is represented by a sub-index, almost always an S&P index. And that sub-index is a collection of other sub-indices that is controlled by a master index, which is the outstable index. The result is that you've got a multi-asset portfolio without using different managers. So you're not having to go down the route of who's the best at managing South African equities or who's the best at managing bonds. You sort of take all the efficiencies in this approach by creating a multi-asset. And what you get is something called a direct stock multi-asset portfolio. So the direct stock multi-asset portfolio is a highly efficient way of running different asset classes in one portfolio because the buy list is actually an index. And the uh, overarching buy list is a custom index. And then you've got the sub indices, which are of course indices of their own right. You could replicate this using a set of ETFs, for example. But in this portfolio, these are CIS and securities, which means at a large proportion of the holdings in this portfolio are actually direct stocks. So it is highly efficient at what it does. Um, and as these reach scale, we can get the holding costs even lower. So if you were to take this to a client level, okay, let's, let's think about an individual client with 500 Rand in their account, their Outfest account. They have got an extremely well-diversified, highly efficient portfolio or a share of a portfolio, which is sitting in a unit trust, but they've got effectively the, the return from this diversified index across local and international. And of course, they're getting it at institutional trading costs because it costs nothing to go in and out of a unit trust. All unit trusts trust in South Africa are single price, that as far as I know. So... That also means that the administration is super efficient. So it means that the number of errors are lower. Just hang on a second. Of course, I have, I have children. Obviously, this is, this is working from home. I have my children in the room, but uh, we'll so please excuse them. No, this, is, this is the work from home world we live in. Grant. This is the work from home world. Like, can you see my screen? Am I on mute? And please excuse my children. <laughs> okay, so let me carry on. 
Okay, so um, so again, what we're trying to do is make sure that the client's got a super high quality, well diversified portfolio for incredibly low transaction costs, and that's this is the way we've chosen to do it. And of course, because it's digital advice, we are using asset allocation as the dominant driver of returns. It's not manager selection, it's not stock selection, it's none of those aspects. It is asset allocation, and we do that using a strategic asset allocation, which is the the main index. And then we um, that that as long as we don't vary that asset allocation is the dominant driver of returns for our portfolios. They are well diversified, multi asset, and the multi asset piece means that we control the volatility. It allows us to control volatility, and of course, as you go to the cautious, it's low, less volatile than the aggressive, and of course, it takes into account the administration. Okay. Our core investment beliefs, they're probably the same as yours. I mean, they're not, it's not rocket science. Historical evidence, and this is the 115 years of the empirical research, suggests that the greatest probability of outperforming inflation over longer investment periods can be provided by an allocation to listed equities. So inflation plus five is achieved about 50% of the time over long investment holding periods using equities. The same cannot be said for bonds. Diversification of investment types helps reduce the impact of short-term price movements. Cost is a super important determinant in what, what an investor gets out and use evidence to select between passive and active. So I'll, I'll sort of show this better once I go into here. So these are the underlying allocations for each of the portfolios. So you can see in the out cautious, we've got a 25% allocation to the S&P SA top 50. And that's obviously capped because obviously NUSPERS is capped in that exposure. So we are, we're getting a exposure to a greater number of shares, of course, in the top 40, I think. And I, I mean, Simon, you're going to correct me here if I'm wrong. I think you get effective exposure to about three, three shares just because of the weight of process and the other dominant weightings of those shares in the yeah. index. Whereas at the top 50, you've got exposure to a greater number of shares because of the cappings. And then, of course, the big decision you need to make in portfolio construction is actually the step in equities. You see, we go from 25 to 35 to 55 to 60. But of course, what's also happening here is as we increase the weighting to equities, we're also increasing the weighting to global assets as you move more into the, the sort of the higher risk portfolios. When I, when I was working at Schroders, um, one of the things we realized is that you know, equities, because of their volatility, have got such a huge impact on the overall volatility of your portfolio. So anything more than a 50% allocation to equity and 80% of your volatility is coming from your equity, equity portfolio. It doesn't matter if you've got bonds in there. And the reason why is that the price movements of bonds is so small relative to the price movement from equities. So if you're trying to control volatility, one of the most important decisions you make, one of them, is of course your weighting to equities. And the second decision you need to make is your factor diversification, which is what other drivers of returns have you got in your portfolio? So you could have property as a driver, which has obviously got a more close link to GDP. You could have bonds, which has got interest rate duration and potentially credit risk. You could have commodities, which are basically driven, have got an inflation component, but also an underlying price of the commodity that attracts. These are all drivers. And of course, if these drivers are very different, then they're going to control the overall volatility in your portfolio. So of course, if you have a sort of an asset or an investment or an account with two or three equity ETFs in it, for example, you're going to get quite a high, high amount of volatility because there's not a lot of difference in correlation in your asset classes. If you spread it out a bit more and you sort of improve the global and local diversification as well as the asset class diversification, you get a better, not better, I mean, it's always difficult to, to sort of speak in absolute terms in investment. The evidence suggests that you can control volatility better. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. This is probably the most important result that we're looking for. There's nothing here that talks about sharp ratios or information ratios or sort of anything. It's really about making sure, and remember this chart over here is the back-tested state of deviation. Of course, it's back-tested, but the results of the actual live portfolios do correlate to this. That 
the standard deviation of the cautious fund is lower than that of the stable fund, is lower than that of the moderate, is lower than that of the aggressive. There's a clear sense of differentiation between the volatility in these portfolios. Now, volatility is easier. If you're constructing a portfolio, volatility is slightly easier. It's more predictable to construct against rather than return. Return is a guess. I mean, I have got no idea what the equity markets are going to do next year, next month. But if you're starting to use risk as one of the aspects, and remember, none of this is absolute. This is all just experience that we're using here and skill, hopefully. I don't want to necessarily oversell what we do. Um, but you're getting a ret risk return profile, which are calibrated into your advice algorithms. That means that when someone chooses a portfolio that's only for two years, you are pushing them into an asset class, into a selection of asset classes that will help them achieve their objectives, but minimizing drawdown of the short term. The other way you can see it is in the return profile. This is a cumulative return profile over time. Now, obviously, you note that the aggressive fund has outperformed the moderate fund, has outperformed the stable fund, has outperformed the cautious fund over long time horizons. Of course, when equity markets fall in sharp, sharp corrections, the reverse is true. The cautious has more protection than the stable, more protection than the moderate, more protection than the aggressive fund. So this is really critical when it comes to the portfolio. This is what we look for, and this is how we, one of the ways which we govern the portfolios. Let's look at the fund performance. Now, I know this is a really busy slide, but again, this is about, you know, at the end of the day, people can say, oh, that's wonderful theory. I mean, it's amazing. Okay, but what have your portfolios actually done? Now, obviously, these are core shares and granite portfolios. And these are the nice thing about having a unit trust is that it falls into all of the performance controls or the, the databases that are publicly used to track fund performance. So this is not a chart that I made up. This is a report from Morningstar. And it's one of the ways in which we manage the portfolios. The problem, again, with having individual accounts sometimes, and I'm not speaking from an individual level. I'm speaking from the point of view of running a business that is designed to look after thousands of clients. One of the reasons you do it this way is so that you can compare yourself to your peers. You can see how you're doing relative to every single peer out there. And there are over one and a half thousand unit trusts in South Africa. So let's just start at the top line. The core shares out aggressive index, the fund, is four star morning star rated. So it's quite a high, I think there's five is the maximum, I'm not sure. And let's move all the way to the three year return. The fund has over the three years to the end of June, 2020 outperformed 87% of its peers. That's a pretty good result. So no one, not, not once have we talked about creating portfolios to outperform everyone else. The way that it works is efficiency. It's just about keeping costs low. And those portfolios are only rebalanced twice a year. And by doing that, just that, you do achieve a decent performance against the peers. So if you look at the Art Moderate Index, this is 62% of all peers. There's 551 ranked investments in that universe. The Art Stable Index Fund has outperformed 64% of its all peers and the Art Cautious 35. Yes, the Art Cautious... I would have liked it to have done better against its peers. We think that's because there's a higher weighting to inflation linked bonds in the portfolio. Are we going to just make quick changes just because we want to look good on a peer group performance? No, it is an important input, but it's not the only input into how we're doing. Uh, we also have to look at absolute returns as well because our clients don't eat relative returns, but by the same token, I need to make sure that um, the quality of the offering is there and it stacks up with everyone else. And the Granite Money Market Fund, 45% of its all peers. Not for me. I mean, it would be awesome if everything was top quartile. You know, when I used to do these reports overseas and we were looking for funds, you, you sort of were cautious about a top quartile performer because it means that they had a very strong sector or very strong, very strong bet. And if that bet fell out of favor, they went to fourth quartile. You've got to be very, very careful of selecting on peer group or past performance. It's a guide, but it's not the, it's, it's, it's not a simple, it's not as simple as saying, okay, cool. I picked the top quartile fund performer. That for me is a hell of a bad idea. So we just, but we do, it's like a hygiene check on whether the funds are doing 
on the platform are, are what, what we expect them to do. I mean, how do we govern this now? So we're not, an, we're not a fund manager. I didn't want to build a fund manager, partly because I wanted to focus on the client experience and the algorithms. But by the same token, we also needed a set of investment exposures that were high quality and were cost efficient and worked with the digital advice system. And it's, it's not easy to get those built. I mean, it's, you, you can't just go to XYZ manager and say, hey, please build me these portfolios. You know, that, that's, you know we, so we actually did this partnership with CoreShares and S&P Dow Jones. And the way that we do it is that we've got a, an, an investment committee that meets every quarter. And that investment committee, I prepare the packs for. And we basically contextualize the fund performance across economic, market, and fund performance, including the peer groups, which is what you saw. And the result is, are we still happy to recommend these to our clients? The difference here, slightly, is that we also sit on the index advisory committee along with core shares and reported to by S&P Dow Jones. They report separately into that and they provide the reporting for that, that committee. They don't sit on the advisory committee, but they report into that. So S&P Dow Jones is the information provider. And the purpose there is to say, well, are the indices doing what they're supposed to be doing? Are they giving you, are the indices providing, oh, I just did that, didn't I? Are the indices providing a graduated set of risk and return profiles? What are the add and the drops to the indices? What is the regulation? Obviously, index regulation changes. What is the regulation we need to abide by to make changes? The attribution, what proportion, what asset, what sub-index has contributed most to performance over the period? So there is a huge amount of detail to get to, to make sure that we understand, number one, not only how the funds are performing, the tracking error of the funds against the indices, and uh, you know, Cautious is doing a great job. They do the reporting on the tracking error. And then, of course, S&P Dow Jones provides the reporting on the indices themselves to make sure that the, the funds are, are sort of delivering in line with the expectations that we have for our clients. I mean, it's one of our duties is to make sure that the funds are, are doing what they say they do. Okay, so I think, you know, in a nutshell, I mean, I, you, I've been talking flat out now for nearly 45 minutes, and I'm sure you guys are exhausted. The proof here is, does outcomes-based investing work? And, you know, this is what clients eat. And remember that, you know, when we built Artfest, we didn't set out to create a manufactured outcome. So you can do this with derivatives. You know, you can create these sort of guaranteed return portfolios if you wanted to. But the cost of those things is so high in return, in the estimated return, that in my opinion, it's difficult to justify. So you could put all sorts of protection, you could buy... You know, you could go put options, you can sell calls, you can have color strategies, you can do swaps where you swap out returns on certain, I mean, you could go nuts here. You could have risk parity portfolios. You could do all these clever little things to try and manufacture an outcome. But if someone else is sort of, if you're swapping that risk onto someone else, they're going to charge you for it. And ultimately the client ends up paying. So that's why we didn't try and go down the route of manufacturing a return for clients. I just felt that the cost was too high. But we still need to get clients to the outcomes. You know, I still need to find a way to get a client to their pension or to their goal to educate their kids. And I need to be held accountable for that. That's what I'm trying to do. So it's a combination of the investment product, the algorithmic advice system that's calibrated to the investment products, getting someone into the right fund for their time horizon. And of course, all the disclosures and management on the tracking system around that. We've actually also got a tracking system that basically every time you log in you can switch on the tracking system and it'll take into account the fund performance whether or not you're contributing in line with the expectations the remaining investment time horizon and the fund that you're invested in to help determine whether or not you're on track to achieve your estimated outcome and because we're also a platform we track every single contract on our platform so we can count whether or not they follow the advice we can count whether or not they have achieved their objective with they've switched funds or if they've um, made early withdrawals. We can know all of that. And again, for investors that, um, excuse the, the grammar error over here, but for investors or for investments, where the goals, where the target date is in the past, so where the person has started an investment and finished an investment, where there were no withdrawals before the estimated date. 
where at least one contribution was received and when the first monthly contribution was received as indicated, where those conditions were met, 82% of um, those goals achieved 90% or more of their target. And that for me is probably the most powerful statement of the business. You know, that's what I look at. So yeah, um, we think it does. Look, markets haven't delivered amazing returns over the last five years. I'm not saying to you that the portfolios are so incredible that they've managed to circumvent all of that. All I'm saying is that we use a combination of common sense, low cost, and good quality advice work to try and help manage clients' expectations and get them to where they need to go. That's me. Are there any questions? There are, folks. If you've got questions, drop them in. Uh, so someone tweeted me and said, is it possible to get the, uh, is, it, is the dim sum, sorry, my video is bad because I'm in load shed, so I'm just going to turn my video off. I'm running by candlelight here. You don't need to see my candlelight. Um, wanting to download the dim sum marsh, uh, it, it, you can't just sum it download. I mean, Grant, they sell it, uh, but they, you're going to have to write them a big check, right? Yeah, so it's, it's about, I mean, I, I, it's, sort of, it's sort of in the tens of thousands to download the data yeah. series. What you can do, and I think one of the things they do is they produce the, the Credit Suisse, the investment bank Credit Suisse, produces the Credit Suisse yearbook. And that yearbook, although it's not the data that you can manipulate, you can, if you can get a hold of the Credit Suisse yearbook, it does have write-ups on historic performance, asset class performance. It's sort of an annual update of their database along with a, I mean, it's a huge okay. report that's produced every year. So. If, I don't know if you can find it online or something like that. You can get hold of the Credit Suisse yearbook. That's something you can do, although as far as I know, it's not available to retail to any, anyone outside of the clients of Credit Suisse. And we're not a client of Credit Suisse. I just know about it from, from when I worked overseas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you can't. The license to use this data is very, very well controlled. Yeah, I wish. I, I, yeah, I mean, I try to get hold of it because they did a lot of testing on uh, momentum strategies, particularly in the LSE, uh, going back 100 years. Um, that's how I first heard about it in the early 2000s. And uh, yeah, they were happy to give it to me if I handed over like Sterling. And uh, yeah. So no, look, I've got his email address. If you want, if you want the email address, <laughs> the prefers, I can, I can send it to you and you can ask them. But uh, yeah, no, unfortunately not. Bunch of questions coming through. Uh, first, just a practical process. Moving a, a fund across into your into your uh, one fee product, how long should that take? I mean, it, 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 to a degree, it's how long is a piece of string, is it not? Look, it, obviously, when, you, when you're transitioning, if you're transitioning in an RA across, then it's a sort of a, I can't remember what it is, not a section 14 process. 14, yeah. So the section 14 process means that um, we have to re receive the documents from the client. We have to make sure we have the information. We contact the, the place where the transfer is coming from. Then we've got to understand if they're penalties. You know, you can't, you can't just transfer a fund unless you've sort of ascertained whether or not that provider will charge penalties. So if they do, we've got to then inform the client and make sure that the, the fee potentially overcomes it. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for the client to do that. Um, and it depends on the provider. I mean, I'm not going to name any names. Some are better than others. Um, some are faster <laughs> than others. So, uh, you know, we've, we do our best. And of course, I can't say that we're perfect either. I mean, there are mm -hmm. always going to be gaps in our service levels uh, as, as hard as we try. But again, you probably know where to find me. Um, and you, you can email anyone at Artfest and I promise you we'll do our best to get to it. Uh, Piers asking, underlying allocations, are they set or are they adjusted over time or something? You kind of alluded to it in the slide looking at the Morningstar performance. Uh, is that it in stone or is it something you would monitor over time? No, we're definitely going to change it over time. Um, we're actually doing our first review now with core shares and S&P. We've now adjusted the asset allocation. So what we're doing is we are moving the aggressive fund to have a higher global equity weighting. We're moving the out moderate fund to have a higher global equity weighting. And we are um, transitioning some of the index linked bonds. So we're sort of balancing some more of the index linked bonds with sovereign bonds. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we try not to make unnecessary changes based on someone's feeling. In order to do that change, we've actually had to write a white paper on that change. So we document every single time we make a change and we evidence mm -hmm. back that change. And so it does take a long time to do. Um, thankfully, you know, um, we're nearly there at the moment. And then, of course, when you make the change, because they are tracker funds, 
And what core shares is going to have to do and what we will have to do is we have to go and amend the fund deeds to go and change the asset allocation. So look, it seems super rigid and, and like slow, but I mean, the idea is also the moment we change the asset allocation, we also have to assess whether or not we have to change the um, stochastic modeling, the cash flow modeling, all of the return estimates for every single portfolio. We also have to then see what the changes will be to those and where they have to update the cash flow model. Of course, the moment you update the cash flow model, every single client who's using the investment tracking system or the estimated outcomes will see their estimated outcomes change. Uh, yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? So it's like everything's linked together, which is both a good and, you know, make changes take longer. Your rebalance process, is it, is it biannual? Is, is, is it rebalancing you know, within the, the structures that you've got? Obviously, you know, some things run, some things don't. You want to rebalance. Is that a biannual process? It, it is, yeah. So the way that it works, obviously, is the sub-indices are rebalanced in March and September. And we've, uh, you know, with S&P Dow Jones and core shares, core shares also rebalance in March and September as well. So the, when the indices are rebalanced, the, uh, the core shares out indices are rebalanced. Mm-hmm by S&P Dow Jones, then core shares will then put the transactions in place and those happen in March and September every year. But if of course one asset class has run hard or we've got, um, we can trigger um, and a sort of an intra period adjustment if we need to. Although the nice thing about having market cap weighted as your sub indices is that you don't have a lot of this sort of movement because it's market cap weighted you don't have a lot of these position shifting of your portfolio in the, in the sort of the changes. It's just not, yeah. you, you can keep your transaction cost quite low. Question coming through from Brandon. He's asking why core shares and S and P Dow Jones and, and, and could you uh, under circumstances change that? We could, uh, we could change that. Um, but I think, you know, I think we, where we sit with core shares and S and P, I mean, designing this thing, I just don't, it's not that common in the industry. So there's not that many people that will come and do this with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's the first truth of the matter is that not everyone's running out of bed to come and build these portfolios with you because the, there's such a lot of restriction around these portfolios because we deliver automated advice. And core shares were really the guys who went so far in terms of, of sort of working with us. I mean, the guys at core shares, Chris and Gareth and Vion, um, and, you know, all of those guys have just been so, so amazing at making sure that we can help these deliver for clients. And, and you know, the guys at Granite as well, you know, Paul and uh, Venetian and those guys, finding those, those people who will help you make sure that you can deliver this kind of new approach. It's not that easy. Yeah, no, fair point. Question coming through uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, plans for Artrest to move into the annuity living or guaranteed at some point in the future? Oh, we can hope, hey? I mean, that is definitely <laughs> something we want to do. I think well, I've got such exciting ideas there. Like there's a, there's a place overseas, there's a company overseas called Wealth Wizards. And it's a robo-advisor that launched many, many years ago. It was run by a guy called Andrew Firth. And it was acquired by Liverpool and Victoria in the UK. And the, what they did was they basically always had a blend between a guaranteed and living annuity and their robo-advisor. And what was so fascinating about it is, is sort of you, you could choose the, the allocation to each. And as you move the allocation, the income certainty increased, but the income level dropped. Yeah, yeah. As you move towards a living annuity, the income level rose, but the uncertainty around the income also rose. And, you know, being able to put that into a framework that helps someone make a, deci- a proper informed decision is massive and like I, I don't want to share too much but i mean some of the tech that you that's already on the platform now i mean the power of the tracking system that we have i mean you can just imagine giving someone control over an understanding of what they can take out reliably from their post-retirement savings it's so exciting so watch the space it's something i'm very very excited about okay and then a question from the same user uh does artfest allow a transfer a pension preservation and provident preservation into a single preservation fund yeah you you can you can but you've got to be aware of what you're giving up remember the preservation funds were created to allow the preservation of the rights that come with those schemes that's right so as far as i understand it and listen i don't want to be um, sort of caught on the wrong side here because I always get confused between a pension and a provident preservation. Both of the schemes you can withdraw 
up until retirement, 100%, once a once off withdrawal yes. of up to 100% before retirement, at retirement, in a provident fund at this stage, you can still withdraw 100%, but a pension uh, preservation fund or a pension fund, you can only withdraw up to one third. Mm -hmm. So it's these things that you've got to, you know, make sure that you're comfortable giving up that right. Yes, you can do it and you can put it into an RA as far as I know, um, but you've just got to be careful that you understand, you know, that if, and, and, you know, heaven forbid, you might desperately need that money, which overweighs all of your future requirements when you retire. Uh, you know, I don't yeah, want yeah. to necessarily, there are circumstances where that happens, but just make sure you understand that. Cool. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there, 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 there's pros and cons, and particularly when you start in, you know, pension provident, it starts to get, there's a lot of other points there. Uh, Anonymous likes the answer. Uh, Brendan asks, do you automatically transition, try that again, transition clients into different funds, lower volatility as one ages? Um, you know, and that's the usual classic as you're sort of getting closer to retirement, the, the process will move you into lower risk, sort of typically higher uh, bond and lower equity. Is, is that part of the, the one fee RAs? Um, no, not automatically. We're, we're an advisor. We don't have discretionary control over people's portfolios. We can gotcha. advise, but we can't. I, don't, I didn't want that power to automatically do it. I wanted the clients to be on the journey with us. And remember that, and, and this is one of the things that I'm, I'm very, very wary of, is that that automatic life stage, in our opinion, it works really well if you're going to put everything in a guaranteed annuity because then you want to protect the value of your built up savings. And remember mm -hmm. a crash just before on the day you retire of down 30% will have a lot, it impacts your income forever. Yeah. So you really want to be very, very careful about how you transition that. But if you're in a living annuity and you're going to go on, out of risk assets into risk assets, you know, are you not just giving up estimated return from your portfolio? Because you know, with, with the valuation of your portfolio is down 30%, and you move it out of an R and you buy living and stay by a living annuity with the same equity allocation. And it's also done 30% that it recovers. You know, it, it's just something that, that we've got. We actually, as I said, we're designing an algorithm now because called the pre-retirement algorithm and that pre-retirement <laughs> algorithm will help you as you start to get to know what you want to do at retirement. It's sort of, it's sort of, well, I guess I explain quickly what it actually does is it creates a duration of every single cash flow you're estimated to require as income post your retirement period. And then it sort of pulls those back into today's terms to select a suitable asset allocation. And the, the closest one of our funds that matches that asset allocation will be the, the best fund for you. But yeah. it depends because obviously if you're guaranteed annuity, that's a full cash withdrawal. Yeah, yeah. Or if you take one third, that's also a full cash withdrawal. And it's about refining that journey a bit to make sure that the asset allocation is right. Uh, last not question. out yet. We, we haven't got it yet. Yeah. It's still coming. Last question because we're hitting our time. Uh, Brandon again, Brandon Naidu. Uh, do you plan on getting a distribution channel? Um, and then suddenly everything disappeared. There we go. A distribution channel. Uh, or can an IFA distribute your products? Oh, that's a good question because <laughs> we are launching with our first IFA um, in a couple of days. So we are, we are starting to do that right now. So it's a flipping exciting exercise for us because, you know, we, some of the technology, what it does for advisors in terms of automated annual reviews for advisors and their clients, the investment tracking system, changing the discussion. And of course, the fee benefits of one fee are just legendary so we're really excited about that okay cool so watch this space as a short answer uh we'll park it there ladies and gents appreciate your time grant re really really thanks that was absolutely epic it was a huge fun and hour well spent really appreciate your time uh, presenting it this evening and and, and putting together the, the presentation for us and you listen it's such a pleasure find like going under the hood of the robo advisor i mean this is a life's work for us at office <laughs> honestly we we do this every day and we love doing it and love to be able to share it. Thanks, guys, for, for being here and spending your evening. Yeah, cool. Everyone, uh, stay safe. Uh, I was going to say travel safe, but we're all at home already because this is our new future. We live at work or maybe we work from home. Never sure. Uh, everyone stay safe. Uh, Grant, everyone, appreciate the time. Cheers, all.